Hello and welcome, and thanks Ian and the print studio, oh, Center 3, Center 3 for uh, putting on this uh, great conference. It's super to have uh, that happen in Hamilton. And uh, for all of you to come out as well, I'm inventor Dan Zen. And uh, mediated reality, past, present, and future. That's what we have in store for us here. So these are chewing powered strobe goggles. So I was mediating reality as I was using them. A wearable computer and we'll see some more of that. And in the future, privacy aura with where you can't really even see people. Uh, let's just talk about uh, mediums though, or media, or a medium sits between. So you have hot, cold, and medium. A spiritual medium lives, or a spiritual medium sits between the living and the dead. And paint and clay are mediums that uh, artists use, uh, sit between the artist and the creation. But any context is a medium in which we can create content. Okay, and so down here, we have a node globe. And uh, this sort of is everything, node zero. And then these are different contexts. And each context or node has content. The nodes below it are the content. So that's all sort of related to the philosophy of nodism, and that's a whole other talk. So uh, we'll get into that later. And just uh, to know that a medium is something that sits between. And mediated, therefore, is something that will uh, sit between you and reality, presumably. Um, before we get into a specific uh, definition of mediated reality, let's take a look at some of the people who have been involved in uh, forming our definitions. This is computer Steve Mann. Um, he's the world's foremost cyborg wearing a mediated reality goggles there. Uh, here I am visiting him and playing his hydrolophone, uh, which was his latest invention. I coordinate interactive multimedia at Sheridan, and I, I created a, a course called, uh, let's see, what was it called? Multimedia Pioneering. And so I've been teaching that for about 12 years, and I've had three to six speakers come in every year we've gone there. So these are some of the people that I've met along the way. Steve Mann I grew up with, uh, and we went to university together, and uh, I called him Computer Steve. Uh, we would go out to dances carrying lytics and so forth. He now, he formed um, at MIT the sort of cyborg uh, group there and came to Toronto and taught in Toronto and so forth. So um, who else do we have here? Uh, Bill Buxton, he could be the founder of the mouse. Um, he created Alias Wavefront, which was an important early uh, visual application for 3D artists and so forth. Um, he came in and gave a talk and uh, I cried. You know, his, he, he knows so much and had such great vision. He was telling us about large screens and small screens and don't just sit here on the desktop. And this was before people were really thinking this way. Um, and he's gone on to become the chief scientist at Microsoft and probably in charge of uh, the Microsoft Surface, which was their groundbreaking blob detection table. Over here, um, oh, that's a picture of me uh, be, uh, taken by Steve Mann. Um, he had me sit still, so I'm sitting still with my Palm Pilot, and there I am with my Palm Pilot, and he took a stick of light and walked around me, and the computer programmed the lights to spell out my name, so my name's on the side. I should have told him that I have a vertical totem, and he could have <laughs> done the uh, lights the other way, but uh, there I am. And down here we have Vincent John Vincent. What a nice name, huh? Uh, founder of Gesture Tech in Toronto as well. We take the class to visit all the time. Almost every museum that has any gesture technology, you know, things on the floor where you move your feet over them and things change, or if you wave at the wall and things change, that's Gesture Tech technology. Uh, they have all the patents on these. Um, for instance, the Sony iCam that was doing it uh, had to license patents uh, from, from them. That stuff, uh, gesture technology, is much like the Wii and, and uh, the Kinect and stuff like that. On the, the left-hand side here is David Rokeby. 
He was um, doing this stuff back in the 80s. He created Jitter, which sat on top of this thing called Max MSP, which is what all these uh, geek computer sort of, uh, well, not computer, even sort of more electronic geeks were doing installation works um, with that. And uh, so any installation works out there, he did the library that handles the, the video recognition kind of stuff. So this is him playing music with his hands. He's just waving at um, a camera and playing music. Uh, so that's pretty incredible considering he was doing that back in the 80s as well. So we're still using um, much of the ideas that he, he put forward. So there's some, uh, hopefully this makes you proud of Canadians. It certainly makes me proud of Canadians to, to be involved in here. A lot of people doing um, work in the hardware. I'm pioneering in the software areas, these, uh, these areas, as, as you'll see. So I'm, I'm going to drop out to an interactive example here. Uh, this was uh, to help you with the definition of, of mediated reality. Mediated reality includes augmented reality when you add things to reality and diminished reality when you take things away from reality and that's according to Steve Mann so um, he's been uh, sort of pronouncing that for some time what's happened is augmented realities well anyway we'll talk more about that let's uh, go out to the interactive example here now uh, control F um, we're going to, uh, you see how we've got a, an average setting here of tables and st stuff like that? Um, what we're going to do is put on some mediated reality goggles, and we're going to give it a voice control command the first time, and the second time we're going to give it a thought control command. Show the chess game with Elliot. And there's the chess game with Elliot. Elliot's here in the audience. Uh, cool. <laughs> Ducking down. Um, so there's the chess game with Elliot. That's augmented reality. Uh, something's been added to reality. And now? Now I'm thinking, I don't want to see dishes. So now I don't want to see those dishes. And look at that. Isn't that excellent? So that's diminished reality. <laughs> Unfortunately, if you get up, you'd probably trip over them. <laughs> um, but... Uh, <laughs> Uh, there you go, and this was an exam, uh, an exam for my students to be able to handle that that interactivity. Okay. Show the chess game. No, 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 we won't need to show the chess game again. <laughs> <laughs> so coming back in, um, old mediated reality. Before, remember past, present, and future. We've just gone through the intro now. Old mediated reality of the past, before there were computers. Well, we've got. Um, oh, sorry, uh, we've got clothing. Uh, clothing mediates reality, so it's between you and the rest of reality. This is um, a house with a person inside um, with lovely, lovely weather. And here are spices. Spices mediate reality. They augment, uh, they add flavor to reality. Thinking, for instance, somebody's philosophy um, changes the way they look at life. It mediates how they're uh, looking at life, as does education. Um, acts like a lens almost, and even physical lenses like magnifying glasses and uh, telescopes, those mediate reality. Here are some, some glasses. They're uh, yellow or orange or whatever <laughs> color it may be. And what I'd like to do now is put on some glasses and not have it always be yellow. I'd like to be able to change those colors. And so that's where the computer comes in. Uh, drugs and alcohol change your mood and how you perceive reality. So they sit between you and reality, as does our current media. Here's a sketchbook. Uh, diagram and uh, what it is is a bunch of projects uh, relating to visual mediated reality that I've done on the left hand side so all of these pretty well exist uh, this is a kaleidoscope and um, what I've done is I've compiled all these uh, in in sort of preparation to talk about uh, goggles this was back in 2010 uh, or no was it 2000 let's just see when was this uh, 2000, sorry, 2000, so 12, 12 years ago or so. And I was hoping to show these, uh, this digital glass mediated reality to my engineering friends, Steve Mann and a few others to talk about how we could create something like this. So I wanted to present them. Here's the type of projects I've been working so far. Herein lies my interests. So kaleidoscopes. Uh, here are a pair of goggles where I had one sort of dragonfly lens in and the other lens you could see through, so everything looked kaleidoscopic as I looked out. 
space goggles here we've um, painted uh, an eye on. That's, that's sort of a different type of immediate reality when people are looking at you and you've changed your reality. But uh, space goggles, um, here, for instance, I'm looking out through a castle scope. Like I, I was, uh, as Halloween costume, I was decorated as a castle and I'm looking through a window and I felt like I was in a castle. So it did mediate my reality. Same with other things like submarines and um, hypnotic uh, goggles. Here's the strobe power chewing, chewing goggles. So all these have been um, created and are around, still in the workshop and so forth. A monocular where it's got a blind on one side so you don't have to squint. Uh, here's um, an egg beater that turns around a pattern that uh, you can look at, so I'll show you a picture of that in uh, just a bit. And so forth and so on, prism glasses. Oh, and it turns out, right here, uh, I don't know if this is true, my mom could probably tell me, but apparently I might have had a periscope when I was young, like in a crib. So I think I was using mediated reality already to make me taller. <laughs> Cool, huh? Okay, so uh, taking a look at the other side, we've got the digital glass, uh, which is what they're calling it now, which is pretty neat. Uh, so remember, this is 2000, they're calling it glass, Google Glass. Google has Google goggles as well, and Steve Mann is calling it glass. So um, here we have a pair of goggles you put on, and the cameras, oh, let's just zoom out a touch. Uh, the cameras are um, here, and so the camera, the, the world comes in, and then the computer mediates that world and shows you the results in your, in your eyeglasses. Uh, you, it's got an infrared thing so you can wave your hand at it and control things like that or buttons along the side. There's smell coming in and out. I'm not sure how smell goes out, but I, I accommodated all of the senses. Taste as well so that we can mediate taste. Hearing obviously is a, is a good one. Um, I diminish reality quite often when I uh, put on my big headphones so I can't hear anything else. That's <laughs> you know, a diminished reality. So um, the idea behind this, it was rather unique as well, is that we would role play it. We would role play uh, imagining we had goggles like this and then we would move to building. Turns out that uh, 12 years later I did write a sci-fi based on it that was somewhat role playing. Here are some of my visual interests. Uh, I think you got the idea that um, I like uh, op art and light shows and stuff like that. That's me operating on a light show with um, an oil drop show. Here are some uh, video feedback pictures on the left that, um, that are done when you take the, the, uh, a camera and turn it negative. So the room is completely dark and yet here it looks completely white. And the screen, which was white, is dark, and that gives us great sort of op art video feedback. Then you point the camera at the screen, and you turn the camera, and it makes these triangles. And you push the camera towards the screen, and the triangles ripple, ripple forward and backwards. It's very beautiful. Uh, down here's the uh, black and white room at the time with mediated reality stuff like the kaleidoscope and the viewfinder was more of a virtual reality 3D stuff. That um, kaleidoscope, here's uh, the output of that kaleidoscope or what it looked like. Um, that's with a combined oil drop and then these black and white, uh, black and white uh, filter kind of things as well. That is from 1974 when I was about 10. Isn't that neat? So I, even back then, I think I was into the same stuff. Or maybe I'm a victim of the 70s. I'm not sure, <laughs> the 60s. Uh, over here um, are playing in light shows. So an oil drop uh, light show. And there I am in my space outfits and so forth. There's the op art uh, over top of me. And this is totally changing the mood or the environment uh, in which we live. So um, up top, another light show. Uh, here's the prototype for that, uh, preparing for the different patterns that overlap. Um, you know, 10 years later, I made Opartica, which is basically a digital version of this, and we'll see some of that. Uh, here's the device right here that uh, puts those on acetate and spins it with a little motor, and that would sit on a, that would sit on a, an overhead projector, and uh, you'd end up with, um, with that. Okay. So that's uh, the... That's my sort of past, that's the past. We've taken a look at some things before the computer of everybody, we've taken a look at my interests in the past that are leading to projects that I'm currently working on. Now let's take a look at some other people's projects in the present. Uh, this is marker-based mediated reality. Here are uh, reality, um, our mediated reality on tablets. 
So um, what you do is you take your tablet, you go out into the real world, and here's an example of using um, uh, layers, which is an application that puts where things are. It uses the GPS and figures out that there's a cafe up there or, um, uh, you know, different places. Have you guys tried this yet? It's coming. It's almost here. So here are some other examples of it. Uh, this is a, a Volkswagen ad. The, the, the tablet, when here you are looking through a tablet, the tablet recognizes the ad, so shape recognition, and then overlays, augmented reality, overlays a big ramp with a car. These are animated, so the car is, uh, is um, doing a big jump, okay? An early version of this was in situ. Uh, this is Macklin, and <laughs> she's looking at the ROM crystal. You see, so this is used in architecture then. Uh, this was an early project in situ. Macklin and Greg did it. Where as they turn that, that's live traffic that's going on and live people, you can see the, um, the ROM crystal in, in place there. Uh, here we are getting extra information about a soccer player. And uh, this is us fixing a car. So it would, it, we look at the car and it would give us the instructions and show us animations on how we can look at a car. So those are, are quite useful. Uh, down below, we've got Computer Steve's eyeglasses. So now we're moving into goggles. So the same types of things could be done in goggles. Okay, rather than holding something up, we're just wearing goggles. And in the goggles, stuff is being superimposed for us. So these are his um, set of goggles carrying on here uh, to the point where they finally look like sunglasses. And here's his 1999 or 2000 um, based invention, and there's Google Glass. Now I tried that on and it shot a laser into my eye and it gives me extra information that is always in focus, which is strange. You look really far away and I can read it. I look close and I can read it. It was kind of crazy. This will hopefully go beyond laser shooting in the eye and just sort of, sort of so I can see colors and stuff because I'm looking forward to seeing, you know, coloring my world, not just, you know, a bunch of text there. Um, and then uh, ideas of what uh, the goggles will look like soon. So let's see what we've got going on here. A. We have inputs. We've got something in the middle, medium, and we've got outputs. Okay, so let's just talk a bit about uh, a bit about them. Um, the inputs, so uh, we recognize a lot of these. We've got the mouse, we've got keyboards, uh, MIDI, time is an input, a wand. I like the idea of a wand so that I can uh, augment reality. I'll take a wand and stuff will come out of it and it'll, stuff will appear in front of me when I use it. And we've seen a wand in, in things like Sony Move. So uh, data, uh, text, or you know, you can use text control, or sorry, not text, uh, voice control. Um, uh, video control, uh, and brain. So uh, I'll show you a picture of me wearing a brain kind of uh, net sort of thing. And then any sensors, like the ones we've been working on in the Arduino lab, um, like uh, temperature and pressure and, uh, you know, that kind of stuff. So the signals from any of these come in, the input, and they go into the computer. At uh, which point... Uh, at which point um, they're read into ones and zeros and then some sort of programming language um, and uh, a, perhaps a virtual machine and into uh, this compiled Swift that something like Flash that I code in uh, works. I'm going to show you a bit about what that coding looks like. Um, and then once the signals come in, it comes into uh, our document class. A class is a, a bunch of code that we write. Code is instructions, we'll call it. Um, so the signal comes into these instructions that we're writing. We're using these things called methods, which are functions and properties, which are like variables. And it comes, uh, many of these are custom classes. So we make them ourselves. We use other people's and we also, as an artist or a designer or a creator, um, make them ourselves as well. It doesn't quite end there because really it should go into our head, shouldn't it? And right down to the idea. And it's that idea that things then come back and come all the way back through the same system to the output. So up here are our outputs. The common desktop output with speakers. 
Bill Buxton's big walls and surfaces, which he's gone to now make the surface. This diagram was made before the surface, actually. They, uh, Microsoft came up with a good name. And we've got OLED technologies uh, coming where big walls will, and we'll talk more about that in just a second. Um, and then we've got small. So here we've got the mobile device. And then uh, we've seen the tablets already being used. When I first showed this diagram, people didn't know what that meant. <laughs> they didn't know about these mobiles and how we would use it. Now we can see examples of them being used. And it's going to be the same with goggles. You guys maybe don't, aren't ready for goggles, but, you know, give it five years and we'll all be wearing goggles. Okay, so we're goggles. And then the step beyond that is implants, where we don't need the goggles. It's just coming into our head. Believe it or not, there's a step beyond that. Okay, it's in the uh, molecular computing world where we just go into digital substrates and we're not even here. But I didn't want to put that there because I don't want to scare you. <laughs> okay, so uh, let's continue on. Or either that is too small. The nano world, I couldn't see it on the screen here. <laughs> um, so here's what uh, that coding looks like. This is a set of open source advanced interface classes. And what are classes again? They're not like come and learn something in a class. It's a, a bunch of, cl it's a classification, okay? And it's, it's like a template. We make objects from a class. It's like a recipe. And every time we use the recipe, we're using the class. So that's object-oriented programming stuff. Um, let's take a look at uh, what these are. There's woodpecker right here. Um, lets you animate to sound. So I've written these classes so that you can easily use them. There's a lot of code that handles the technology, but the artist or the designer will take a look at the type of code they would have to use. It's much less. It's like one or two lines of code sometimes. So that allows you to animate to sound and get the frequencies of sound. Ostrich lets you put a cursor, instead of where the mouse is, put a cursor where your hand is moving. So that's the gesture technology. Penguin is tilt technology, and uh, Goose is multi-touch. Both of those we now have in mobile devices, but when I made these, we didn't have them. So I was preparing the um, coders and builders to be able to use tilt technology and multi-touch and blob detection and things. Hummingbird is uh, easily animating. Robin is a multi-user server. You know how I did um, Goose the multi-touch? You know what multi-touch is? You touch two things or more things at once and things happen. Well, unless we had a multi-touch screen, we couldn't practice it. But what I did is I used Robin, the multi-user server, so that I could use two computers with a laptop and a desktop with two mouses controlling two uh, cursors inside of the same application. And so that allowed me to practice opening up a picture and closing a picture and, and other people as well. Like I said, these are open source. Um, Robin, I'm just reprogramming in Node.js. Thank you, Andrew. Yeah, Andrew's helping me out with that project. And Falcon allows artists to get data back and forth from um, these things, because uh, sometimes that can be difficult. Let's take a look at uh, the results of Ostrich. Here's what happened. Look at that tongue. Can you see it? Yeah, you can see the tongue. That's good. That's red. Um, <laughs> but anyway, uh, they're reaching for things. And the concentration and the joy, and there's that Elliot again, as we um, play Pong. So he's reaching and controlling a cursor in the, the screen. This is a $10 webcam. And he's controlling it going that way, and I'm controlling this one going up and down using Ostrich. Here's a fairy that's following my finger. So do you see... Yeah, you can see my hand in there, so I'm reaching, and that hand looks like an ostrich. That's why I called it ostrich. It's, uh, when I use it, uh, it reaches. So that fairy is following my finger, um, and there's a couple blobs that are on my hand, and I'm quite surprised at that. Okay, so how, how does it work? It, we're like magicians, and I was a magician, so maybe that's why I like all this stuff. It's like magic. Um, in a video, you've got frames, so when you take a, a, a webcam, it's capturing images frame by frame by frame and showing those to you or to somebody and it looks like a video. So what we're doing is we're taking the two pictures, uh, one frame and another frame, successive frames, and we're applying a difference filter. Just like in Photoshop, you can use a difference filter. It's a blend mode. What it, a difference filter does is colors can be represented by numbers. So black is zero, 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 you know, like, and anyway, um, it's taking each pixel, it's subtracting what number that color is from the associated number from that color. And if, the, if they're the same color, the difference is zero. And what color is zero? 
black, right. So wherever there's no change in, in color, it's, um, it's black. But if, there, if, the, if color has changed, that means there's motion there, hint, hint, then it's not black, it's a different color. So here um, we can see the difference between those two is something has moved, the hand has moved a little bit, and then we applied filters, and since I'm a bit low on time, I won't go into it too much, but we apply filters and we get a box around it and stuff like that. Uh, the code to do that is here. All right, I won't uh, zoom in on that code. A lot of it is explanation, but you don't need to know that. I need to know that, like I needed to know that, <laughs> and I did that, um, and, and that's kind of what it's like. What you need to know is just over here. Uh, well, I'll zoom into it like so. Okay, just that bit of code. Now, some of this code is what's called boilerplate code, as in you would use the same type of code in everything that you do. The, the real code that is for ostrich is just kind of like these five lines here, and those are pretty simple. Um, again, because of delay in time, I won't go. I, I, I would have liked to talk to you a little bit about code. If you want to work in this and if you want to control the mediated reality that you have, you probably will have to code or be able to use simple code like this for, for maximum um, ability or what have you. Uh, it's not too bad, and that's what Interactive Multimedia at Sheridan, for instance, does, is it, it tries to, um, or it teaches uh, artists and designers how to code. We've got a couple of variables. This is storing a camera, an ostrich camera, and uh, this is storing a cursor. We're saying, hey, when it runs, this is what runs first, when it runs, make a new ostrich camera. So we're making a new object, a new uh, ostrich camera from our class that I've provided. And then add that um, to the bottom, zero. Uh, and then add a listener. The listener is sort of saying when an event happens. Um, so when the ostrich camera is ready, call the function init. So do whatever that wants you to do. So add a camera, put it on the stage. When it's ready, call this other function. Here's the other function right here. And here we're saying, make a new cursor. This is the cursor that's going to follow the motion. Make a new cursor and pass it the camera object that we made. So now this cursor knows to pay attention to that camera uh, that, that we have, and then add the cursor. This would give you a cursor that follows your fingers. Okay, so not bad. And you can make a fairy follow your fingers, <laughs> okay, or whatever you want, maybe not a fairy. Don't copy me. Okay, so um, that's, uh, that's an example, and it's very similar to the rest of, of these that are here. That allows you to work in these areas. Um, I'm preparing to make a new program called Mediated Reality at Sheridan, uh, a post-grad again, that allows you to work in these areas. So Mediated Reality, physical computing is when you've got um, computing that's not happening on the, the desktop or on a laptop or on a mobile device, but it's happening elsewhere. It's happening in toasters, it's happening on clothing. So wearable computing, the next one is a subset of physical computing. That's when you wear your computing. Uh, mobile mediated is when you use a mobile device to mediate your reality. That's very similar to that augmented reality stuff we were looking at with the tablets. Uh, I'm going to show you a project, a mediated reality, um, or a mobile mediated game uh, that I made. Collective control is when multiple people are controlling the same thing. Okay, um, we haven't seen much of that yet, but imagine in a movie theater when everybody with their smartphones, half of the theater is controlling a character over here and the other half is controlling that. And it's sort of random, there's a lot there that's really exciting. I'm working on a project on that too, but I'm not gonna talk about it. Um, over there is interactive installations. So a lot of artists uh, work in interactive installations. Um, that uh, means sort of out in galleries or on the streets or what have you. Whereas interactive walls, more specifically, I'm kind of thinking that that would be in your homes or in schools or in hallways or in shopping malls. And so uh, in my home, I have, a, I have posters of all of the games I've made, uh, or many of the games, early games primarily. And I look up at those posters on my wall and I go, oh, wouldn't it be neat if I could just use them right here on my wall? And then, oh, then I could start mixing them together and all this kind of stuff. And from that, I've, uh, you know, I've seen the future. I think that's what's going to happen. Um, so on location interactivity is what marketing terms um, when for instance you're in a store you're looking in a mirror but it's not really a mirror because in the mirror is you 
but with clothing that they want you to try on. So you're just sort of going next, next, and you're seeing yourself with the clothing on and you're changing, oh, I wanted this color, and then you hit buy. You know, that's on location um, uh, interactivity. Uh, holograms, when we're tired of these two-dimensional screens and even the 3D goggles, we're going to have holograms that are sitting, you know, the help me Obi-Wan Kenobi stuff. And uh, that'll become really kind of neat when it comes to like uh, nano mist, where the hologram's not really a hologram, it's, it's kind of real. <laughs> so we can control, anyway, that's far in the future. We'll leave future for later. Um, virtual reality is the sort of the far end of mediated reality when all of reality has been taken away <laughs> and you're just looking at stuff that's made up you know and we've we've seen lots of movies and stuff with virtual reality but it's neat to think of the sort of the flip of that imagine people in second life like a virtual world and they're putting reality into the virtual world so like a television in a room in in the virtual world is showing news from reality <laughs> so it's kind of anyway mediated reality in reverse or something like that uh, these ones along the bottom are gesture control so these are some of the interfaces gesture control shape recognition that's important if you want to do useful things not so important i mean i don't need it for artistic things but useful things like i look at a tree and this information tells me what kind of tree that is all right uh, blob detection sound recognition and brain control are different interfaces that we would be working with all right, a couple examples of what I've been working on in the present, I guess we'll call it. Uh, this one is called Touchy. Um, it's uh, a game, a mobile mediated game, where um, the, the mobile device gives you a target, and uh, a target and a timer, so you're trying to touch each other's mobile device. And uh, it, when you do the other device, you know, you, you lose points there, for instance. And here are some of the people um, playing uh, touchy. And you can sort of see the, uh, the concentration uh, that's on them. Oh, hang on, it's a little bit zoomed in. Um, you can see the concentration on them, and there's a family all kind of getting into it. Russ actually hits the drums with the device in that case. And, and the pure joy of, 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 you know, the people and the exercise they're getting. So instead of playing a game inside of the device, um, the device is mediating the game and acting in between. Uh, there I am um, playing it out uh, and so forth. There's, there's the Club Penguin folks uh, playing it. But I notice the guys play it like it's, um, like it's karate. It's sort of like, hi, ha, ha, ha. And uh, you start to get a little bit worried about the devices at this point. So I'm now making Tilty, where you just hold your device away from all the action, and you push the other person. And so you try and tilt the other person, and that way the device is a bit more protected. And of course, you lose points if your device goes not level. So uh, that's an upcoming project called Tilty. And look at this little fellow. Oh, isn't that fun? And he's reaching. I played this in a nightclub. Uh, can you see that? Oh, you can't quite see it. Uh, um, anyway, there's a guy here, and he's reaching for this girl who's, you know, like, a, and they, they don't even know each other. This is the first time they've met. So I played it at a lounge in a nightclub, um, and everybody along the lounge is going, what are you playing? And it was just, like, transformative. There were a couple girls on the dance floor uh, nobody was dancing. So imagine a room like this. Nobody's dancing, but tons of people after a conference are all mingling about. And so I said, hey, do you want to try this game? And I go up to them and give them the, uh, the, the devices, and they started whirling all over the place, and everybody starts coming around, standing, going, oh, my God, and everybody's laughing their heads off. So it had potential, I, you know, and it still does. I'm hoping that it, uh, it can go. So that's called Touchy, a mobile-mediated game. Um, here's a wearable computing uh, application I made called Hangy. Some of you may have seen me around uh, wearing Hangy. It's uh, when I wear a device, like a medallion, which I call a Mobidallion. Um, and uh, it's surprising that nobody's done this yet to use current existing devices as a form of expression. Uh, I've been looking, I've been having my students kind of look for me over the last three years to see if anybody's been doing this in wearable computing, and nobody has. And so uh, now I kind of say, well, I've got a little bit of time, I'll do that. And so I've done it. Um, I think this could be a way of the future. It's, it's using your mobile devices we currently have for expression. And it's got, I'll give you a demonstration of it afterwards. You can um, tap at certain places in this invisible grid interface uh, here. 
hey, yeah, there, <laughs> tap, tap, <laughs> that was a lucky shadow. And um, uh, then different things come up, like a happy face or a sad face or a greeting messages or a light show if you want to wear it for fashion and stuff like that. Oh, okay, oh, go away. Oh, sorry, next. Um, how y'all doing? Good, okay. Um, we have got a few more and then we're going to look at the future. The future. All right, right now, uh, this is an important, it's probably the most important screen. I remember how we said shape recognition is important for all those like um, serious uh, uses. What I'm going to show you here is not necessarily the serious uses, it's the artistic, it's what I consider the cultural and emotional uses and sort of the, the mood uses of it. And you don't need to use shape recognition, okay? And people just aren't doing this yet. They're all doing that useful stuff, holding up tablets. Well, okay, let's take a look. Let's um, talk about some of these things. Each of these circles uh, we can talk about. Can you see that circle? Yeah, the circle looks good. Good, um, that's me doing psychedelic dancing as exercise. And um, it's a cutout of me kind of, isn't it? It's a sort of a posterization. I'm really just against my curtains. I'm like dancing in my living room here. And I'm superimposing um, a pattern. And this is a moving pattern. This is Apartica. It's actually a moving pattern made by an interactive tool. Um, this tool that we're looking at, the, the round circle, is a Zen mix. It allows you to take any web video and any picture put them on top of each other and apply these blend modes. So this is probably a difference blend mode. And that's what makes it look so cool like this. But as mentioned, I'm not, it's not a picture that I'm blending this with, it's an interactive work. So I'm putting an interactive work inside of an interactive work. And indeed I can put Zen Pan in there too and blend multiple interactive works. We have a DJ and a VJ for video um, blending and I am an IJ. Uh, so a few years back, 2006, I was kind of saying, I'm the first IJ, I'm the first IJ, and nobody's listening, but whatever, I am the first IJ. <laughs> so um, anyway, that's what we're doing. We're blending interactive works in there. Now imagine going around and uh, looking at people at a dance club and having them posterized. So they're, not, they're no longer there. They look like this, and you're putting over top the, the light shows that you might want to see. Or... Um, if you're talking to somebody, Zen Mix was a tool to allow vloggers, those talking heads, to make their stuff look a bit more interesting very easily. Um, so here's a talking head, so you're FaceTiming somebody, that happens to be me, but I'm looking, at, I'm in the woods, and I'm looking into the woods, and so now I'm blending them talking in the woods. That's much nicer than just seeing them in their living room or what have you. And here we're adding like an elect electric afro. That's actually a candle. I took my camera and spun it around the top of a candle and that's what it looked like. But I do have an electric afro. That's feedback, video feedback. Um, when you sort of go right into the feedback, not the normal looking stuff, but way into the, the you know, way into the core of the feedback. That's what it looks like. It breaks up into artifacts. Um, fabrics, patterns, etc. So again, you know, I could sit on my hammock and look at uh, my wife Roseanne up in the clouds. Uh, <laughs> wouldn't that be cool? And underwater and more candle stuff. Um, here we have uh, something from my meta mystery. Um, I'll show you the stories that I'm telling with this in just a sec. But uh, those are words. Can you see them there? Not really. Well, it's actually their numbers. That's pi. It's a solution to a mystery. But um, they could be words. So as she's talking to me, I'm translating her words. It's easy enough to get audio translation. Translating her words and running them across my vision. <laughs> Isn't that neat? Um, you could posterize her and then put her words in a little caption. And you could be walk around looking at everybody like they're in a comic strip. <laughs> Crazy, huh? And uh, here's inverted. Inverted's quite easy to do. So I love inverted stuff. Why don't I just walk around and, you know, remember my sunglasses? They're making things yellow. Boring, you know. I want to make everything look really wild and inverted. Superimposing philosophical aspects and so forth. Blurring things. I take, I take Focuso pictures because I love the world in blur. Some of you can blur by just taking off your glasses. Other people aren't so lucky. <laughs> so now I want to put on these glasses and, and control the amount of blur that I see. And I can do that. So my next project is to do stuff like this. 
No shape recognition needed. It's just the same stuff as this, really. It's just the same program, except instead of taking any video on the internet, it's taking any video from your own mobile device and apply these types of blend modes to them. Okay, and, and overlays. So um, wonderful possibilities there. Okay, um, Opartica Tunnel. This is the latest version of Opartica. Some of you might remember it from a few years back, and it's amazing. This is a beautiful uh, three-dimensional Opart picture that um, moves in 3D like a tunnel, so you go through it. Uh, these types of things here, that's a bit brighter, I suppose. Um, these types of things are, are like tunnels, and they move towards you. So as I have these in my head, I can jog. And when I jog, these tunnels are coming past me, and I'm jogging in tunnels. Life would also, the road, the sidewalk, would be superimposed underneath. I'd be able to see where I'm going, but I would have a whole sky filled with this stuff. Or if I'm driving in a car, we could match the speed to the car and things like that. You know, I wouldn't be driving. I guess I would be the passenger, wouldn't I? Um, and uh, it would just be most amazing. This, by the way, is Apartica. Here's the, the panels on how you create it. Um, that, that one's more of a tile-based one. Um, this one's uh, not a tile-based, and uh, you can say how many circles you want and all that kind of stuff. So um, that's Apartica Tunnel. Please check it out online. It's Apartica. It's been, if you type in Opart tool, it's been the number one Opart tool since the, uh, the mid-90s. So uh, here's some light shows then. I uh, can't quite see it, but there's a band in there. There's light shows in the back. Uh, that was very successful. And this is the type of thing that it uh, creates. Uh, sorry, that's, that's Lou there. Lou from um, uh, the St. Hollywood. And it just sets the mood to have something to have something that looks like this so much sets the mood. He looked back at these lights and you could just see him go, wow, and he's now able to sing and so forth and act like, uh, like he's in space. Uh, this is um, a small sampling of the op art holiday cards that I gave uh, people. Um, each one was individually made for the person. So, uh, you know, if a dad was Scottish, I would make a, one that looked like a thistle. I tried to match the mood to the people. And um, I wanted to send one to all my Facebook friends, but Facebook stopped at 500, wouldn't let me send anymore. <laughs> and so they're all customized, they're all up on, uh, on Flickr and stuff, and you can see the variety. Uh, and again, the idea of creating a mood for a place. So if I know I'm going to school, I can make moods for school. If I know I'm going to a dance club, I can make moods for there. And then I can add those on, augment uh, reality, or even meeting people. I meet people, and here's what I want them to look like, and <laughs> there it is. Okay, the future, because that was the present. <laughs> Isn't that neat? Like, that's coming up at the, uh, d during the holiday season. That's probably what I'll be working on, is so that I can do what I've just said there with those types of, um, of pictures. Here's the future. We often see the future uh, through books, Okay, um, for instance, this one, Virtual Light, uh, is, is William Gibson's book uh, talking about mediated reality goggles. Um, that was back uh, whenever, uh, when was that, 1993. So it's easy to write about things because you don't have to sort of actually make them, etc. So movies, you've got to make at least views of them or visions of them, so that's a bit harder, but we still see the future through movies. Um, uh, like this, and head-mounted displays and games. Games is another place where we can explore the future. Uh, there I am in my Halloween costume of sci-fi movies, so obviously I kind of like that. But for you as artists, as, um, as creators, where you can do it is with um, short stories, okay? You don't have to write a whole book. Just use short stories because that allows you, to, it gives you context that you have to come up with solutions, technological solutions or even cultural solutions, we'll call it, artistic solutions. Um, so here's a, a set of uh, interactive storytelling um, applications that I've made over the years and many of them have allowed me to see the future uh, in a different way or in a new way or in my own way perhaps and hope that uh, if we can see the future I think that will help us get to the future a future that we want 
And so this is a series of interactive storytelling applications. I'll highlight a, a couple. Uh, this one down at the bottom is Zenmix. We already talked about that. But the story that I'm telling in it is called Meta. It's a meta mystery. And um, I'm trying to tell it from young to old. So it has 13 stanzas or 13 paragraphs. And each, um, each one uh, started off with young people doing it. And then slightly older, slightly older, all the way up to old people. And I'm, unfortunately, I'm at my age right now and I seem to have stopped for a little bit. But... Uh, we, we had um, people be able to tell this story. It's a pretty neat story. It's turned into really a whole future environment in which a lot of my other stories stem from. And it itself stemmed from this Save Earth game right here. Save Earth, uh, it was a pattern matching game, but we did a neat sort of mediated reality experiment um, in here back in 2000 of a sensory system. So in the future, can you see that? In the future, um, what you're saying when it goes into text will have moods associated with it. So these highlighted humorous, uh, excited, um, relaxed, questioning, etc. At the moment, in this game, what you did is you would write in a forum. This is the forums for the game. You would write in the forum and highlight things when you were excited. So you would be putting your own mood on there. And it made use of CSS, which is uh, pretty cool back in 2000, so that I could click these on or off, and the text I'm reading would be um, mood mediated. So I can find only the excited parts or I can find the uh, complaining parts or the serious parts. That's good search engine um, functionality in there too. So that was neat, uh, imagining that instead of us as, as I type, I don't really want to select things and say, I'm happy now. <laughs> you know, I would rather some biosensors do that for me. So, you know, as, as I'm talking, it knows the mood from my biorhythms or what have you. and. Uh, could imply uh, that in there. So Altura is another interactive storytelling app that you should try if you want to try writing short stories for the first time. Okay, Because you can sit there with a story and get stuck. Altura is kind of fun. It's a, an interactive storytelling app, like a choose your own adventure. Do you see how we have, hey, something's happening here and you can choose these options? But it's pseudo because no matter which option you choose, when you go to the next screen, it still shows whatever the writer wanted. <laughs> you know, so it's a linear story, but it's providing options that really you can't follow. So it, it would read like this. Uh, you're a brain molecule and a builder bot in Nanoland, yet your bot is constantly getting into trouble. Now, first of all, I'm already imagining what the future will be like in the nano world, a bot is controlled by multiple brains. Do you remember what that is called? Collective control. So we've got multiple brains controlling one bot. So I'm writing a story to see what that would be like. Okay. And uh, so um, let's see. Do you continue on and ignore the problem that your bot's acting up? Suggest uh, the creators recreate your bot? Encourage your bot's other brains to behave. Hey, you've been acting up. <laughs> Seek out why your bot is different. So those are the options that you as, uh, me as a writer, I have to figure out what options I'm going to give you. What that does is it forces me to supply options. Okay, this is why it's a good writing tool. Now I've supplied options. Maybe I like a different option than I expected. I actually like this option better, and so I'll continue me writing. I'll continue the story from there. And so I found that this was a wonderful way to write short stories. Now, the end user says, oh, say you choose D. Seek out why it's different. And in this case, hey, that's the same as the majority. You know, that's how I dealt with it. That's the same as majority. We get to do that. But if it was the wrong answer, <laughs> it would say, sorry, that was different than the majority. Here's the next situation. So I'm not sure you quite got that. It's a little bit tricky to describe. Um, anyway, you get, you get the, the next uh, situation. So check that out. It's Altura. It's made for, um, it's made for the mobile uh, device as well. So you can tell stories on your mobile device. A uh, snipisode. Everybody is on Facebook these days, or Twitter or something, and so that's a bit of an issue. So why not try and encourage storytelling through Facebook? So that's what snipisode was. You create a short story, you let snipisode cut it up based on periods or new lines, 
and then Snipisode will publish that snip, so that sentence, uh, once a day, you know, or once every two days, at whatever time you want. So let's say seven o'clock, it, it will publish on your feed one of these lines in order. Now people would see that out of context, but the thing is, is they can always hit more story and then see the whole story so far. So these are called Snipisodes. Um, there's a really neat nano one called Soup Makers, where in the future, here I am exploring the future through short stories. In the future, when we have nanotechnology, if you throw it all into a little dome and let it do its own thing, what happens? It's like a soup. Will we get life from that? What will happen when it all comes together? And so um, that explores uh, that kind of Soup Maker, Soup Maker 1, Soup Maker 2. So these are the stories I've been able to make with Snipisode. I want to just read you a bit of one from Kuzbian Chronicles, because it's specifically the mediated reality goggles. So once again, exploring um, our future or what, what we want through, through stories. So the Kuzbian Chronicles. Uh, sorry, that looks like a lot, doesn't it? I'm not sure if uh, you can read. Oh, that's good. So this is what the Snipisode would look like. It's a bit like poetry, so uh, just to shake a little bit. We're almost there. We've got, uh, I think, one or two slides after this, all right? So are you ready for some poetry? It's weird. Okay. All right, let's see if I can do it. Am I ready? I think I'd be ready after a sip of ah, liquid. Hmm. Kuzbian's dad could count things without counting, apparently from years of computer data manipulation. You try, just try and guess how many people are in your class or in your uh, office without, you know, really counting. Well, Kuzbian wore a computer tucked up in his canary yellow glasses, and this way he uh, did his counting. So canary yellow IBR glasses, Intuit building reflex glasses, map shapes and motion to help the wearer predict the very near future. Perfect for blading at breakneck speed in rush hour. Perfect for the job at Crisis Courier. Crisis Courier employs a network of the best bladers to get NDIs between city spires fast. NDIs are non-digital information. As everyone knows, is the hackless form of communication for extra sensitive situations. Crisis has the patents on bi-blade roller blades that in a hop, split down the middle, swing up and pivot to rest against the lower legs, leaving the blader in their boots. Then it's just a hop, pop, and go. Do you get that? Yeah? Yeah? Oh, well, it doesn't really matter too much. Crisis for crisis emotes the news vibe into the public's decompactor plants. The third crisis courier to be taken down loses package and stocks dive. A fault in the bi blade auto tilt sensor, says social safety agents, the SSA. Fault my bleep cream, curses Kuzbian. Hack is the track. We can't snap these cracks on our wear packs. That means our antivirus can't keep up with the virus. Folks, spokes, broke, a la some remote bloke. Evil is afoot. Tires untangle before the eyes of Kuzbian as the IBRs extrapolate streams of future motion. The auto tilts Max as he splits a pair of parked pods. Those are cars. Dodging peds, people, dodging peds, he picks his way past cafes. Pizzow, what the flick? Cloop tog, the blade retract initiated. A high speed nightmare. Chaos forms in the canary goggles and gives way to urgent arrows directing a boot thrust and Kuzbian sails in a slow motion arc, turning his head to the standers. Bystanders, that is. In the whirling crowd, the, the goggles grope face after face. Alpha Yepet, a hack tenna with fading break beam ripples. Springing from her seat, her finger grapple points at the package. Kuzbian twirls and catches a pole. Five times around, Kuzbian dissipates the speed and sees his assailant run into the shady cafe. He identilocks her and reboots his blades. Round the block he races and scans a plague of peds. A ped two blocks ahead blinks red. That's who he's chasing. Consuming live street view, 
So we've got live street view in our goggles. Imagine that. Consuming live street view, Kuzbian paralyzes and heads off his assailant. As she flits down the path, he zoom views her lips and transcodes her message at syllable 90 proof. So he spied on this woman and read her lips from afar to know where she's meeting. So two clandestines later, he is before the viral Vishnu. Kuzbian activates his Google's emergency SSA feed, streaming live to the hive, and his facial recog tacks a man from a van extending a hand to the Vishnu. Positive, Archibald Crown, CEO of Crown Antivirus. Crisis uses Crown. The SSA decorates Kuzbian for revealing that the antivirus company was making viruses to keep the people buying new protection. The SSA vlog destroys Crown's market value and social justice reigns again. Long live the scandal! But what was in the packages? For whom was Crown working? Tune in next time for the case of Z. -Z Here you go. <laughs> so in there were about three or four inventions that I didn't think of before I wrote this story. So that's why that's good. Now I'll leave you with a more of a distant future. Kind of. <laughs> more of a distant future. This is Focuso. Um, now we've been talking about mediated reality that sits in our own goggles and some of you may have been thinking, well that's a little bit strange. Now I can make other people look how I want them to look. Do you get that? You know what I mean? So in my own goggles, I'm making you look posterized or I'm making you have these colors or I'm diminishing your clothing or I'm, you know, there's a variety of things that you can do. Um, in these goggles that other people then can't really see. Now, I have a workaround for that slightly. I would, it would be really neat to reverse, the, to not reverse it, but double-side it so that you can look at my goggles, which are here, and see what I'm seeing. That would be kind of neat too, but it's not always going to happen. Now, this is sort of a mediated reality idea that instead of the mediation happening in my own goggles here, every item itself is mediated. So for instance, uh, with OLED technology, we could paint onto money and have the money look like, um, like this. Uh, so this could be done with a nano mist uh, one day where the nano mist is like a screen and it gets projected on the screen. So that could be controlled by something um, or it can just be controlled by it itself. And, and we could have a world that uh, looks like these beautiful colors, you know, and uh, we're just walking around in it. And that's like the privacy aura and so forth uh, was there. So a mediated reality um, by the devices or by the objects or by the people themselves. Mediated reality, past, present, and future. Uh, the, the talk or the show can be found at danzen.com slash mediated reality. So all these slides will be there and you'll see them in full color um, at your leisure. Uh, which sounds good. And I'm hoping that this might be what Hamilton looks like if we overlay, if we, if we, and, and we could help people understand that. So as you look through um, a scope or something up on the mountain or at the waterfront, uh, you could see uh, projected onto current existing places ideas like the McMaster Dream Center and uh, the new Hamilton Nano Complex right out in the water as we explore nanotechnology. The Burlington Genetic Towers, as we, um, I, you laugh, but this is my vision of the future. I would love to work with dreams. We've got all these scientists working on such important, I suppose, medical reasons and you know, all this kind of stuff, but we should be, the people who have Einstein's brain should also be thinking about culture and entertainment. And so like shifting some of that work on the brain into dreams and dreamware, uh, dreams for entertainment and so forth. Uh, and if we thought about that now, we could turn Hamilton into a place where this does exist. Really, we could. So uh, that's a, pot a potential future, and I hope um, perhaps some of you might be with me one day. Thank you very much.